this message entitled Conflict Resolution was recorded at South City Church in Brighton, UK. But you know, World War II was the most severe conflict that ever took place, that man has ever known, right? I mean, I've done reading upon reading on the World War. I'm just fascinated sometimes by the characters that came up, by the mistakes that were made. Uh, there are wonderful lessons, I think, if you were able to just go and study the history of the World War, what led to it. But the war didn't just suddenly happen. The war didn't just suddenly take place. There were things that led to the war taking place. There were warning signs, if you would. Warning signs that that conflict of a huge scale was imminent. But you'll find that a lot of those warning signs were ignored. And I want to look at those things. I want, I'm not going to look at the World War per se. But I'm not dealing with physical warfare this morning. But there are some things that we can learn from a physical war. We can pick up on the early signs that lead up to conflict. I'm dealing this morning with conflict resolution. We talked about it this, this Wednesday and there were some amazing things that came up, wonderful insights that came up, and I'm, I'm not going to rehash those things. But we want to look at several biblical texts regarding the resolving of conflict this morning. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, if you would. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2. We'll begin our reading there and we'll just read a couple of verses and we'll jump around a bit. Two weeks ago, we spoke about, we, we started our, our talk on kingdom relationships. Last week, we did a study on postmodernism and the Christian reaction toward postmodernism. Today we're dealing with conflict, conflict resolution. And Ephesians 4 verse 2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Jump all the way down to verse 22. And it says there, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Verse 25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood, and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for you are all members of one body. In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redem redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. And then it ends in verse 32. It says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Quite a list of things in this text here that he talks about. And the book of Ephesians, if you've read it at any time, wasn't originally written with chapters and verses. It was a letter written to the Ephesian church. But if you can break up the book of Ephesians, apart from the chapters that have already been divided there, you can break up the book of Ephesians into two, into two halves. The first half of the first three chapters of Ephesians deals with our identity in Christ, deals with the blessing that we have as being believers. Our identity, what God did through the cross, and who we are as a result of what He did. It's a wonderful couple of chapters. Uh, it starts off by saying you've been blessed with all blessing, all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Alright. The next chapters though, 4, 5, and 6, tell us how we should live. It doesn't just talk just now about our identity. It says now because this is who you are... 
this is how you should live. And it talks in detail about how we should live. So we pick up in chapter 4. And uh, he's, chapter 4, we'll begin to discover that we can only live like this when we understand our identity in Christ. So you've got to have the first half. You've got to understand the first half of what Paul is trying to tell the Ephesians. He's saying, in order for you to live a certain way, you've got to understand who you are. You've got to understand what God has already done. All right, so we did a study on Ephesians. I remember a while ago when, uh, on one of our Bible study nights. But let's start reading again from verse 22. And it says there, you were taught, this is the, uh, we'll start, this is important here. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, before I do that, I, you know, Yana was baptized a couple of weeks ago, and I think everybody was there. Freezing water... But there's Yana making a public declaration, which is what baptism is, a public declaration that the old is dead and the new is, has come. You with me? The old man is gone and the new man is now alive and risen with Christ Jesus. That is what baptism is all about. So here we see that Paul is saying now that you need to put off the old. Shouldn't be coming back again. Put off the old man and put on the new man. What's described, what's represented in baptism should be lived out now in this walk that we're living in. Now, I'd like to ask, whose responsibility is this? It's mine. Who, whose responsibility is to put off the old self? It's yours. It's mine. It's us. It's ours. It's our responsibility to put off the old, to be renewed and to put on the new. Now, there are a lot of words used to describe the old self here that we're going to read here. But I want to use some of my words before I use Paul's words here. And just tell me if any of these sentences sound familiar in your own life. Or maybe you've heard it. I'm not talking to that person. Or I'm not talking to this person. Or that person's not talking to me. We're avoiding each other. Hey, I'm not talking to that person because they did something to me and we're avoiding each other. I'm avoiding that person. So I see them in the street. And because I know there's something there, I avoid them. I avoid eye contact. I, hey, it sounds familiar at all. I don't like that person very much. Hey, I've heard that before. Maybe I've said it before. I don't know. And we're proud of that. That's the scary thing. Sounds like the old self to me. And I think it's also equally bad to say, I'd rather not say anything to that person. I'd rather not say anything to Colleen because I don't want to have any conflict. That's equally as bad. Uh, just let's pretend everything's okay. Now let's look at how Paul describes the old self. Okay, let's look at some of Paul's words to describe this. The first thing he uses in verse 25, you'll see it there, is the word falsehood. Falsehood. It's quite a strong word. But uh, I think falsehood could mean telling a story so that... Uh, you can make yourself look all right. You can make, I, so, I, so as to make myself right and to make everybody else look like they're wrong. It's easy to do that. It's easy to tell a story, to weave a story so that it makes me look right and somebody else look wrong in terms of a conflict situation. If I'm retelling a conflict situation to a third party, If I'm telling a conflict, an unresolved conflict situation to a third party, it's very easy to gather a bit of support from that, those folk. It's very easy to gather a bit of support and nearly everybody who hears the story ends up ganging up on that poor brother who's being talk, spoken about. And eventually what's happened is maybe we sort it out, but now the 10 or other people, 10 or so other people who don't know that we've resolved it have an issue with that brother now. They've got an offense with that person. You with me? And they walk into the church, and guess what happens? Suddenly, all those people that know about the story begin to think, oh, it's so-and-so. 
Better not go anywhere near that person. I better not have anything to do with that person. Why? Because now they've got this story that's been built up by somebody else. And they've taken up an offense here. The second thing that he lists there, though, isn't just falsehood. The second thing that he lists is unwholesome talk. It's a very interesting verse. And so if you go with me to verse 29, we'll read it again. Unwholesome talk. He says there, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for the building up of others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I think this verse is extremely challenging. Let's ask ourselves the question, does any unwholesome talk come out of our my mouth? There's no need to nod or raise a hand. But the question is, does any unwholesome talk come out of my mouth? There's probably nobody like that here, hey? Is the next thing, is everything I say helpful for building others up? According to what that verse just said, verse 29. Is everything I say helpful for the building up of somebody else? Is everything I say beneficial or of benefit to those that listen? I don't know about you, but sometimes after I've said something, there's regret. You know, particularly if well, Nick and I don't often have a, a disagreement. But sometimes you say things in the heat of the moment, and you say things, and there's regret after having said it. You know, there's a picture of the bowling alley. How many of you have ever been 10 pin bowling? And it's like the words leave your mouth. And you can see it. And you know skittles are about to fall. You know pins are about to fall. And there's this regret. And what happens? It's too late. to, And you think it's too late to do anything about it. So then you actually begin to justify it. And then that justification leads to a fight. And an argument. And eventually you don't talk to each other anymore. Paul says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of you, your mouth. What about words like, you always? What about, you never? Hey, I'm sure you've heard of those words. You always leave your socks on the floor. Or you never pick up your laundry. You never wash any dishes. It's just me washing the dishes all the time. Hey, you never wash your mugs after you drink your coffee at church. You never. Hey, does that sound familiar? I know it's familiar in my life sometimes. Sometimes that, that thing comes out and I've got to deal with it. It's like our emotions rise up a bit and something happens and our emotions get involved very quickly. It's very easy for us humans to get our emotions involved in something. It's like you get your machine gun out and... Hey, and there's stuff flying all over the place here. You never, you always, and we smash people. We, you know, shoot them up with our words. And you always, you never, which is seldom true. And then you need to patch up the relationship because now they're all of these holes. The next thing Paul uh, describes as the old self is bitterness. I'm not going to be long this morning, guys. I just want to try and open up these things, these scriptures to you quickly. Bitterness. And in verse 31, it says, get rid of all bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15 says, it says, So see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Conflict is often the result of bitterness. And so we see bitter lemons coming out. And what happens is, not only are we satisfied to drink our own lemon juice, now we want to hand out lemon juice to everybody else. And include them in it as well. The Bible says that the only way we can get bitterness is if we miss the grace of God. That scripture I read in Hebrews 12. And bitterness causes all sorts of trouble. Bitterness causes trouble, it says, and it defiles many. It doesn't just stay with you. It doesn't just cause trouble in your own life. It says bitterness actually results in defiling many people. It's passing on the lemon juice. 
Bitterness is extremely damaging to me, but also to those around me. The next thing he uses there, the next word he describes to the old self is rage. And then anger, rage and anger. You could say that if you wanted to give a definition for that or, or uh, other words to, to, that go along with rage and anger, you could say fierceness or violent passion. Rage is violent passion. That's rage. And I've seen rage outworked in the lives of some. See red. Hair stands on end like a cat. Claws come out. Rawr! I've seen that. I'm being overly dramatic here, I know. But that's what rage is. But you could be saying, John, I'm not a rageful person. I, I don't scream and shout. I don't uh, throw my toys out the cot. I don't smash people's heads in or anything like that. I don't have rage. We're talking about a violent emotion here. We're talking about what's on the inside. We're not talking just about what happens on the outside here this morning. We're talking about what happens on the inside. You might be very gentle on the outside, but on the inside, I think everybody, every one of us here is capable of a violent emotion on the inside. Every one of us. And Paul says, actually, that's part of the old self. That's not the new man. That's the old man there. And those are the things that need to be put away. Is it easy to do? No, it's not. But he goes on talking there about brawling. I mean, that's bad. Now, he's talking about people within the church now. He's writing to a church, by the way. He's not writing to the Brighton and Hove City Council to deal with all uh, the binge drinkers out there. He's writing to the church and he's saying that you should put off all of these other things. Brawling. I mean, these guys, I mean, they must have been. They, they were duking it out, maybe. Fighting. He says, put off brawling. The next thing he talks about in verse 31 is slander. The Greek word for slander is actually, actually blasphemia. Hey, that's where we get our word blasphemy from. Blasphemia. That's the Greek word for slander. Very strong word speaking about people's... Speaking, uh, slander is speaking badly about people. Speaking badly about somebody else. Putting them in a negative light. I wonder if you could go with me to James chapter 3. We're nearly there, guys. James chapter 3 and verse 3. Tell you, these things are important. It's important that we listen to what God is showing us this morning because we're, we're in relationships all the time. We're dealing with people all the time. Whether we're having coffee together, whether we're having barbecues together, whether we're coming to meetings, whether we're going to work, whether we're going out to Brighton and Hove beachfront, whatever it is, we're dealing with people. We're seeing people all the time and we've got to be able to have handles as to know how to have good relationships. So that, especially within the church, that there's none of this in the context of us. Because that thing breaks down covenantal relationships that, that's a value for us. Friendship before function. This thing breaks down friendship before function. Then we just function together. Then we just come to meetings but sit on extreme parts of the room. On opposite side of the room, we will come to meetings. But don't get me to talk to them. I'm not going to have coffee with them. It's, it's, I'm, I'm not talking about things that are impossible, guys. It can happen. Even in a small church like ours, that can happen. Verse 3, it says there, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so la large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest 
is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a word of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is in itself set on fire by hell. I mean, those are strong words to describe the tongue. And verse 9 says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men. Who have made who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. Brothers, this should not be. God says, put off the old self. The slander that comes out of our mouths toward other people, painting their reputation black, we should put off that. And then lastly, Paul lists... In his list there, he says, put off every form of malice. Every form of malice. Before I deal with malice, let me just say that in terms of slander, you know, sometimes we can cover up our slander by saying, well, let's, let's pray for him. Or, you know, let's, let's, uh, let me tell you something about so-and-so so we can pray for him. Hey, I mean, have you ever heard of that before? I, I'm sure. Hey, but that's the same thing. You gotta be really careful, guys. I want to protect the the uh, the name of somebody else. I want to protect their reputation because I'll know I'd like somebody to protect my reputation when I'm not there. In my absence, I'd like my brother to protect me in my absence. So the the thing is, let me protect somebody else. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Paul goes on to say, talk about malice. And the Strong's commentary, when describing the word, uses words like badness, naughtiness, and wickedness to describe this word malice. And Paul says, put all of these things away. Put off your old self and then may be made new in the attitude of your mind. For me, the first step to being made new is not to excuse ungodly behavior in my own life. Not to excuse it, not to cover it up, or to call it by another name. If I've acted ungodly, if I've reacted in the flesh, if I've reacted in an ungodly manner, I don't call it personality, a difference in personality. I call it what it is. I'm, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I'm sorry, I was too hasty in what I said. Payment, I'm sorry. I spoke too quickly. Please forgive me. You've got to deal with it quickly. There's no excuse for sin. And there might be a reason, but it's still not an excuse in the eyes of God for having spoken a certain way. Well, it's my mother's fault. It's my father's fault. I mean, they were bad to me. They spoke badly to me. Oh, uh, my mom left me my nappy too long. That's why I'm the way I am. Hey, we, we can blame it on everything else, but not take the responsibility ourselves. So I've got all of these emotional scars. Oh, it's my wife. It's my husband. If, it's, if I didn't have them, then I'd be so peaceful and calm. Hey. We prayed that God would send them in the first place. And when they arrive, we're saying, oh, they're the reason for all the conflict. They're the reason that I'm so angry. They're the reason that I've got ulcers now. If you've got children, ah, oh, the children are the reason, man. That's why I get angry so quickly. They, it's their fault. They, Abigail cries all the time. That's why I get irritated. And, uh, hey, oh, it's my colleagues at work, man. It's my friends. And it's the shifting of blame to others. And if we shift blame to others all the time, we'll never be made new in the attitude of our mind. I can stop and say, I'm sorry. I can, just a word, just stop myself. Hey, I'm sorry, Diane, for, for that thing I said to you. And then my mind starts to be made new. How do I allow my mind to be made new? I think another way is to allow the surgeon to cut. It's to allow the surgeon, the great surgeon, the heavenly surgeon to cut away the cancers in my heart.
to go before Him with my words, with my attitudes, with my thoughts, with my reactions, with my yesterday, the things that took place, and to say, Father, those things that I didn't do, the things that, I, that didn't please You, Father, just cut them out of my heart. To do with it. Say, Lord, You help me. Help me. Cut them out of my heart. God, Lord, set a guard on my heart. What does Paul say in Ephesians again? He says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We actually want to stop conflict before it happens. And this is why Paul is saying that. Be completely humble and gentle and patient. I'll tell you what, if you're completely humble and gentle and patient, there's no reason why somebody should be uptight with you. And take offense. And if they do, then it's their issue. It's not yours. Conflict never just happens. There are always signs that lead, it, lead up to it. Matthew chapter 18. Go, go with me to Matthew chapter 18. There's just a few verses that I want to read there. And while you're going there, who wrote the book of Ephesians? Anybody can tell me who wrote the book of Ephesians? I think I may have mentioned it already. Oh. Paul did. That's it. That's right, Michael. Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. And you know, the thing is, if you go to the book of Acts, you find Paul in a heated argument, having a heated argument with Barnabas. Now this is Paul, the great apostle. This is Paul planting churches all over the place. I mean, he was shipwrecked. He was beaten up. He was for the gospel's sake. And, but here's Paul having a heated argument with Barnabas in the book of Acts over John Mark. And Paul says, I don't want to take John Mark because he ran away when trouble came. And Barnabas believed in John Mark and they had a heated argument about it. But you know what? It didn't end there. Those guys resolved it. Because if you read later on in the New Testament, you find Paul saying, actually, bring Barnabas with, I mean, bring John Mark with, me, with you. John Mark was the reason for that contention in the first place. He's saying, bring John Mark with you because he's beneficial to me in the ministry. See, there's, there's, there was a resolve there. Paul, speaking these words, experienced relational issues and conflict, but he dealt with them. He's lear he learned how to deal with them correctly. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. And it says there, If your brother sins against you, Go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as though you would a pagan or tax collector. We're dealing with conflict in the church. And my first point today is the conflict in the church is overshadowed by a heart that wants to forgive. That we want to forgive all the time. When uh, Peter, in just a little ways after Matthew chapter 18, says, Lord, how much should I forgive my brother? And Jesus says, what? How many times? 70 times 7. In other words, it's not, it's not the mathematical amount. He's saying, forgive always. Just forgive. So as Christians, we are to forgive all the time. Forgive. But it doesn't mean, though, here's the, the, the clarification here. It doesn't mean that we sweep everything, we sweep wrongdoing under the rug. It doesn't mean we sweep wrongdoing under the rug. Matthew chapter 18 says that if your brother sins against you, then it tells us what to do. It tells us there. It doesn't say ignore it. It says deal with it, but this is the way you deal with it. This is the way you resolve that conflict. Ignoring it is not resolving it. This is the way you deal with it. It says there, firstly, your brother. So he's talking about believers. He's talking about those in the church. If your brother sins against you. Right, so we're dealing with Christians here now. The way we deal with Christians, yes, applies to the way we deal with those that are in the world. But there's a difference in the church. It says, if your brother, and then it goes on to say, if your brother sins against you. There's a difference between sins and personal preference. 
It doesn't say if your brother steals your parking spot. You're on your way to church and they Avinash grabs my parking spot there. Hey? Or it doesn't say that uh, if your brother sits in front of the chair where the fan is where, and you wanted to sit there. It doesn't say if your brother looked at you funny walking down George Street and he ignored you. He ignored me. I don't know what was on his mind. It doesn't say if your brother ignored you on the street and then you go and take him to the elders of the church and deal with it there and box it out and bring 10 people with you as support. It says sin. Sins means that he's done something that's biblic that, that he's gone against a biblical precedent. He's gone against God's word in, in, a, in, a, in, in the way the word describes. And then it says, your brother who sins against you, it says against you. So the only time I can apply this text is if somebody sins against me. It doesn't say that if your brother sins against my friends and if he sins against my uncle. It says if your brother sins against you. It's very interestingly enough that it doesn't say go and speak to 10 people, win them over, tell them your story, get them on your side and then go and deal with it with the issue with your brother. I've seen that happen. What does it say? It says, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. Just between the two of you. Let me tell you, if we obey that, this verse, it'll cut down, I think, half of the conflict issues. Because first, is it a sin? Yes, it is a sin. Then I go to my brother. I don't take a whole bunch of people with me to go and confront my brother. I go first, me and my brother, and I deal with it. If Julie did something wrong and I know it's sin, man, I need to respect the relationship and obey the word and go straight to Julie or go straight to Bill. Not go run around getting, getting support and then a whole bunch of us come, Julie, Bill, you guys are wrong, blah, blah. You with me, guys? Just the two of us and be reconciled, it says there. <coughs> now imagine if Christians obeyed this verse. And then it says, if that doesn't work, if you going to your brother and dealing with the sin that he committed against you, if that doesn't work, then you get two or three other people. And let me say, they need to be, I suggest, two mature, spiritually mature, objective people. Not violent, aggressive, on your side type of people, uh, but spiritually mature people. And if that doesn't work, then you go to the leadership of the church. And the eldership need to get. I'm grateful for those that have been gracious to me and the mistakes I've made, even leading this church. I've been grateful for grace. Because I've received grace, I can extend grace. You with me, guys? Because somebody has been gracious to me, I, I'm, I, there's, a less, there's less of a chance for me to be critical. You with me, guys? And that's how we build each other up. That's how we protect unity in the church. So I'm, I'm only talking to, about it, not because stuff's happening, not because you know, James has gathered 10 people around him and he wants to now be pastor. <laughs> not talking about that. Uh, these are just kingdom relationships. And uh, you'll, there will always be opportunities for conflict to arise. There will always be an opportunity to be offended. Let's just love each other that much to do, deal with it, but deal with it correctly. And when we go to our brother, don't go just say, Yana, I, t I got something against you. You were silly, man. You were stupid. And use words like that. You think you're going to get any resolve that way? No. Be completely humble, it says. Yana, listen, I, 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 may, I might be wrong, but I think that this, this needs to be dealt with. You know, this is an issue. Be completely humble and gentle and deal with it. 
then there's resolve, then there's restitution. You with me? Let's pray.